Good morning. Will you stand and sing with us? The song's called Sing Along, so sing along with us. When I look into the painted skies, I see so many Crossroads. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor with us today, I'd just like to welcome you and invite you after service to go right outside our side doors to our welcome center. We have a gift out there. We'd love for you to stop and grab that. Also, at this time, if you would, grab that green piece of paper you got on your way in. And we know it says the wrong date, so you don't have to tell us about it. <laughs> there are some announcements in there. They are still correct. Everything is for this week. Uh, if you would notice that we do have our midweek meal this week, and then we also have men's breakfast. So, Wednesday, 4.45 to 5.45 is our midweek meal, and then Saturday morning at 8 o'clock is men's breakfast. So please put those on your calendar, come out and join us Wednesday before worship, and then come out again, guys, on Saturday morning. Uh, if you would, let's go ahead and let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll continue with worship this morning. Father, we come to you, and we thank you that we can come in today, and we can just look at the bulletin and see that we're all human, we can laugh that... Uh, we don't have the right date, even though we know that today is Sunday. We're coming in to give this time to you, to honor you, to lift you up, to worship you. Uh, just thank you that we can just just laugh a little bit this morning also. I pray that you be with us throughout this week, the things that we have planned, but allow us to remember that uh, you have things planned that we don't know about yet, and allow us to see those opportunities, to take advantage of them, to see that, uh, that you give us chances every single day. To, le to lead a life that is honoring to you, but also that is bringing other people closer to you. So may we do that. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You know, we celebrated the life of Jack Edwards yesterday. Um, and Miles had referenced the 23rd Psalm. And it said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is here with us. And we need to celebrate his love for us. Will you stand and worship with us again? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life,
for our communion time today as we meet about the Lord's table. The song we're singing is, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. And you might say, well, how can the crucifixion of Jesus Christ be beautiful? It's beautiful because of His love for us. We look upon His face. We have the opportunity each day to be His child and accept His grace. Today I have a question as we prepare for communion time. Are you stuck on God? The 32nd Psalm that 
Miles is going to be speaking to us about here in a few minutes. First two verses of that psalm tell us this. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Historians and theologians believe that David wrote this psalm shortly after his repentance from the adultery he committed with Bathsheba. All of this psalm could be a song of celebration. David was a man that was stuck on God. Yes, he made wrong decisions in life. I might ask myself the question, what about me? What about you? Does God leave us? No. But we may leave God. He has sent his son to allow us to continue to be connected or stuck, if you will, to him. David is blessed, and we can be blessed as well. Today we have a reminder of how we can be stuck on God through his son, Jesus Christ. David reminds us that God doesn't forgive and cleanse begrudgingly, but he does it because he loves us, and our sin does not change that. His love is unfailing, even when we repeatedly fail. I just love this. He wants to forgive me. He isn't forced to do it and isn't, and isn't exasperated by having to do it. He loves us. He delights in our return. The bottom line is we need to be stuck on God every day. The memorial we partake of is a reminder of how God has provided a way for us to be stuck with him for eternity. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord, I thank you for this special time, this special moment that we come here in your house. Yes, we worship you this day. Yes, we hear your word proclaimed. All of those things would be for naught if not for your love in sending your son Jesus Christ to save us. Help us to focus on these this day. Help us to continue to be stuck on you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
come to our offering time today, I would like to mention to you that a general fund budget for 2013 has been approved. The elders have met and approved that. I believe it was on December the 19th. My plan today was to have a little copy there with your bulletin that would show you what that budget is, and I apologize to you. That will be forthcoming in the not too distant future. But I tell you this, the, this fact, though, that uh, uh, I just am in, in awe oftentimes of the generosity of God's people, how they bring their tithes and offerings into his house each first day of the week and allow his work to continue to reach out to the world about us. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord, I thank you for this time that we have this day. We come now at this time to remember that you've given your all to us. And I just pray now that as we, with open minds and willing hearts, present back to you a portion of that that uh, you've given unto us. Just be with this offering this day. Help us to be good stewards of it as we help grow your kingdom. In your son's name I pray. Amen. appreciate that. Why don't you guys stand up and uh, shake hands with one another, greet somebody uh, this morning. Take just a moment to do that.
All right. Good job. You always do so well at that, which is a good thing. I mean, that's really a good thing. It's nice that you're glad to see each other. I've visited churches before where they don't even act like they're really happy to, to see one another. So it's good that you all are glad to do that. Hey, uh, yesterday, in fact, Nancy, I have to tell you that yesterday when we were coming back from the uh, cemetery, uh, there was a young man out here on a motorcycle who, and I, and I happen to know who he is. Uh, I think Kenny knows who he is too, but uh, this young man was stopped out here by one of our city police officers, and I guarantee he was doing more than 45 and a 35 because I know the young man, and uh, he didn't look very happy when he was leaving. So, uh, so he knows the stuff. That, uh, that drives you crazy. Uh, the flowers this morning are in honor of uh, uh, Jack Edwards, and, and so the family just uh, uh, blessed us with those this morning. And, um, and then as well, I want to just give you a real quick report on Homer Abney. Some of you may have gotten a phone call last night that they had taken him to the hospital, but uh, he was having chest pains, but they were minor chest pains, according to him, and they went away. So he didn't go to the hospital. So uh, just in case anybody was planning to go to see him, he is uh, at home. And, I, and they may be here uh, second service. We'll see. So uh, anyway, just wanted to make sure you knew that. Uh, we're in this series, Jesus is My Everything. And uh, I, you know that really should be our goal throughout life, um, to grow closer to him. Uh, to give ourselves over to his will, to give ourselves over to his plan for our lives. And if you remember from last week, we examined what it would be like to walk with God constantly. And in fact, I left a challenge or gave a challenge um, that when we left here, we were to see how much of our lives we could turn over to him. Uh, 86,400 seconds in each day. And what I asked you last week was to consider how many of those could be dedicated to the practice of God's presence and understanding that he's with you. And here, here's the deal. I mean, unless you're just engaged in something that you really shouldn't be engaged with, God is with you. And so I guess what I'm asking is that you just simply acknowledge that. Uh, see, oftentimes we forget that he's with us. But he promises that he will walk with us. And again, as long as we're not involved in some sinful behavior, he is with us. You know, he's even with us when we do slip up sometimes and, and, and sin. Even, but, but if we're intentionally doing it, then God will remove himself. And, and, and so I just want to remind you that if you walk with him, if you are a believer who belongs to him, then he is with you. You might as well acknowledge that he is. And so live in that manner. You see, my goal for 2013 is that we as a body would draw closer to him every, in every way and every day. That we might become people who walk with God in all that we do. Because the Bible is clear that it is possible. And I, I know that in our day and age, so many people think that it's not possible. That, you know, there's no way that we can be like Abraham or like Isaac and that's not the promise that God has made. He said that he walked with Abraham, that he was with Isaac, he was with David. And if you fast forward to the Gospel of Matthew, this is what we read. The virgin will be with child and shall give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God sent Jesus, sent Jesus for the purpose of reuniting his creation to himself. He sent Jesus so it can be said that you and I walk with the Father. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's, that's how we should be known as a people 
who walk with him because he is with us. And so this morning we're going to tackle one of the major obstacles, I think, that keeps us from drawing close to the Father. And so if you uh, haven't found it yet, turn to Psalm 32. We're going to look at the five, first five verses initially, and then we'll uh, get into the, the rest of the psalm in just a little bit. Psalm 32. It is a psalm of David, as Terry uh, stated, and it is believed that he wrote it not long after uh, um, his sin with Bathsheba and the death of, of uh, their son. But there in Psalm 32, the first five verses read, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Um, in, the years, in the years that I've been counseling, uh, I have determined that there are people, that people... Uh, give information and receive information in, in basically two different ways. There are some people that I would, I would state are, are kind of the, the ones that whenever they're coming to talk to you about an issue or, uh, or talk to you about a problem of any sort, <clears throat> they would be the, the individuals that I would say um, kind of hint or beat around the bush. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, most of the time, women kind of fall, fall in this characteristic, especially in conversation or communication with, with their husbands. They tend to, to hint at things. But, but some people, whenever they're sharing information, are the same way. They will just kind of hint at it. They don't really, they don't really get to it. Now, the other side of that are, are folks who are very blunt. And so you'll notice this morning that I've entitled this message, The Bottom Line. And, and that's what I mean by the bottom line, is that, you know, we are direct with God. And in fact, what we're going to be talking about, if you haven't already uh, understood from the first five verses, we're going to be talking about confession this morning. And confession with God is getting to the bottom line. You know, it's, it's sometimes when we approach God, we're just like those people that we go before him and we hint and we beat around the bush and we, we, we try to disguise things sometimes, or sometimes we even try to cover them up, as, as David writes in this psalm. Sometimes we try to deny that we've done anything wrong, and, and so we stand before God and we look like that person who just kind of, you know, just, just beats around the bush. They're, they're gonna, we're going to hint at it, we're going we're gonna to get close to it, but we're never, ever going to share with him the bottom line. And, and so in order to draw closer to him, in order to make him Jesus our everything, we have to be willing to practice this discipline of confession. Um, it comes down to a relationship with God, our walk with him, and he wants us to be bottom line people with him. Psalm 32 is one of seven penitential uh, psalms. What that simply means is that the, writers, the writer of those psalms was penitent in his heart. He was coming before God. He was confessing uh, sin, and that's exactly what uh, that word means. It's one of seven psalms that deal with confession, and this one especially focuses on the discipline of con uh, confession. David teaches us what confession is in this psalm. He, he states what it does for us, and he also states how unconfessed sin can destroy us. Confession is what I mean when it comes to the bottom line, being direct and straightforward with God. And so we're just going to break this down just a little bit, these first five verses. And the very first question is, how can unconfessed sin hurt me? 
Can I ask somebody to grab me a glass of water or a bottle of water, please? Thank you. How can unconfessed sin hurt me? You know, decongestants and all that kind of stuff are really good things. But man, you get a dry mouth. And I had a cup of coffee, but it's gone. How can unconfessed sin hurt me? If you look again at verses 3 and 4, David writes there, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. You know, a couple of things that he describes there really sounds like, um, it really sounds like guilt, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's this guilt that is weighing him down. And, and it's guilt, he's, he feels guilty because God already knows and he understands that God knows his sin, but he hasn't been willing to come to the Father and to confess it. It could be because others know of his sin as well, and yet he's not dealt with it openly in a way um, that, that he feels as if he's let it go. I mean, probably most of us have been in a position where we've been so overwhelmed by guilt or by something that we have done wrong. Maybe we've treated someone in the wrong manner, and we've been so overwhelmed that it was like it was eating you alive inside. And that's what David is describing. He said, all during this time, when I kept silent, when I refused to acknowledge my sin, whenever I would not confess my sin, it was like your hand was heavy upon me. It was like all the strength was just sucked out of me, like in the heat of the summer. Now, I've only been to that point a couple of times where um, I don't necessarily believe that I suffered from heat stroke, but... Probably all of us at some time have actually been so warm that it's just like it takes all the energy from us. And, and so David is talking about, you know, he, what he's describing is that he's even depressed over this. He, he can't stand to do anything. He doesn't have the energy to do anything. And, and that's what unconfessed sin um, can do. And so why is confession so foundationally Important, thank you very much. It's kind of tough whenever you feel like your tongue is going to go one direction that you don't want it to go. So, how is it so foundational? Because it really is foundational. Um, why is it so significant? Well, Francis Chan, who uh, some of you know who he is. We've done some studies. Uh, he has a book called Crazy Love uh, that is very popular today. And, and Francis Chan shares an illustration about a time when he was in a prayer meeting. And he and another pastor were leading this prayer meeting. And what he had, he had uh, um, promised or what they had promised the the individuals who were there, which were church leaders, they were ministers, they were elders, uh, Sunday school teachers, and they promised them that they would pray with each one of them um, because what they were talking about is confession and unconfessed sin. And, and oftentimes, believe it or not, you know, those sometimes who look like they've got it all together actually have something there that, that they struggle with over and over and over again. And so Chan and this other pastor uh, told them that they would pray with them. And Chan says that he was absolutely blown away because at the end of that service, the line stretched from the front clear out the door of these men and women who were coming forward and who were confessing their sins. Some of them were talking about uh, the bitterness that they had towards their spouse or, or maybe the bitterness that they had towards their, their children or parents or whatever it might be. Some were confessing uh, extramarital affairs. Um, but but here's, here's the deal. What they were doing was setting things right. They, they were coming before God and they were setting things right because they had been living a lie for so long that they were feeling exactly as David was feeling, that God's hand was 
was heavy upon them. That they couldn't accomplish what God wanted because of this unconfessed sin. And David is very clear in this psalm that that's exactly what happens. Now, could it be that so many people approach church service or the church in that way? That, that, that they come in and, and, and chant, in fact, he says it this way, I wonder, I wonder how many of us come to church every single weekend and we never deal with the real issue. And, and it's just like David in verse 3, we keep silent. We keep silent. We come in and we sing some songs and we attend some classes. We throw some money into the offering plate and then we go home. Meanwhile, there is this major issue in our lives that we are neglecting. And, and people say, well, does that happen? It absolutely happens. I've shared this with you before, but I come from southern Illinois and in my family, in my family, there was a, a history of abuse, and I'm talking about sexual abuse. And there was a congregation down there that hid that, that denied it. They kept silent about it. They would not address it. And, and I have, you know, I can, we could go down there. In fact, we may just do that. We'll just pack everybody up and we'll take a field trip to Lovell's Grove Church. Because there in that auditorium in that sanctuary is a chair that's dedicated to the memory of my great uncle and he he was simply a pedophile does it happen absolutely it happens it happens in churches today it happens in individuals lives you come in and and you never ever deal with the real issue you are never willing to confess your sin. And, and Chan said this, and, and I completely agree. If that's what we're doing, then what's the point? I mean, seriously, what's the point? What's the point of all this if that's all that we're doing? If we don't get real, I mean, let's just shut it all down. Because there's no reason for it. Let's pack it up. Let's go home. What's the point of doing some religious things if we're not going to deal with the true issues in our lives and in our hearts? There's another minister who addressed the subject of the danger of unconfessed sin in this way. He brought into the auditorium right up on stage. A big box. <clears throat> and in that box was a big pile of horse manure. And this is what he said. Imagine that this is your living room. And right in the middle of the living room is this, this horse poop. I mean, right in the middle of it. And you got company coming over, and so what you decide to do is you decide to tidy up a little bit, and you start to dust over here, and you dust this off over here, and you dust this, and all the while there's this big pile of horse manure right there in the middle of the floor. And he says that's kind of what we do in, in the living quarters of our heart with Jesus, that we'll dust around everything when really what we need is a shovel. What we should be using is a shovel to get rid of, of this stuff. Now, now, here's a couple of thoughts with this. I really thought about calling uh, Terry Evans and saying, hey, can I borrow a little bit of uh, horse poop? And, and then I thought this, somebody will say, somebody right now saying, I'm really glad he didn't bring horse manure in here because... After all, this is God's sanctuary, and this is God's house, and, 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 and here's what I'm going to say to you. What about your heart? What about your heart? See, that's, that's the problem within the church today. Some people are more concerned about what happens in this room than you are about what happens in your heart. And so that same pile is right there. 
in your life and smack dab in the middle of everything and you dust around it, you clean around it, you wipe off the windows around it, but the same pile of horse crap is there because we refuse to deal with it. And then there are others who are thinking this, I'm glad I don't have any major sin in my heart. Well, be careful about that because more people... More people have slidden down that slippery slope to hell through little sins, quote-unquote sins, than making major mistakes. In fact, um, taking from C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters, here's a quote from it. Screwtape, writing to his nephew Wormwood, says, Indeed, the safest road to hell is a gradual one, the gentle slope. Soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. And so his point is that it's those little sins that so often trip us up. So overall, the danger in unconfessed sin is that we can fool ourselves into thinking that we are doing well. We can fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing better because we're simply not acknowledging this this major issue in our lives. And as long as we dust around it, and as long as we play at our relationship with the Father, we can feel good when all the while there is a major obstacle between us and Him. We can't get closer to Him because He won't allow it until we're willing to confess. And so, that leads to the second question, what is confession? What is confession, and and how do I go about it? I want you to look at verse 5. David writes there, that I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So simply put, confession is acknowledging our sin before God. It's willfully looking up at the Father and saying, Lord, I've messed up. I mean, I have messed up. I've, you know, I've made a mistake. You might have to say to him, I willfully did this. I knew I shouldn't. But I willfully did it. It's just simply looking at him and saying, man, I have messed up in a major way. Now, now some folks have a difficult time with confession because if you were to believe them, they never, ever do anything wrong in the first place. And so some have that kind of, you know, they never make mistakes. And so they're going to have a hard time with confession. Now, we know better than that because the Bible says that all have sinned. And fallen short. And the Bible also says that even the good things that we do are like filthy rags before the Father. And and so we know that we all mess up. Others, I believe, struggle with confession because they reason if God knows everything to begin with, then why should I need to confess? I mean, if he knows this sin is there, why should I need to confess? And I believe, first of all, we confess, or he wants us to confess, because God wants to hear it from you. He wants to hear it from me. I think about a child who has done something wrong. You know, I coached for several years football in high school, and there were times, there were times whenever you just kind of wait for um, someone to admit they made a mistake on that play. It's refreshing. It means they're learning something. You guys, you understand what I'm saying? It, it means that they're learning, that, 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 that they have a responsibility and that they're accountable. And, and so I think sometimes God wants to just simply hear it from us. Because just like us, we want to teach our kids that they can talk to us at any time about anything. And I, I believe that's what God wants from you and me. He wants us to be willing to come and talk to him when we're hurting. He wants us to be willing to come and talk to him when we're in trouble. He wants us to be willing to come and talk to him when we're rejoicing. He wants to be able to talk to us even when we have sinned against him. David, in the remainder of the psalm, demonstrates that what confession does 
is brings us back into proper relationship with our Heavenly Father. He, he says here, when I confess to you, when I acknowledge my sin and did not cover up my iniquity, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And then look at 6 through 11. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. And so someone who is in right relationship with God, even when the waters come up, they won't be affected. When the tide rises, they have nothing to fear. You are my hiding place, verse 7. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. This is God speaking to David. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts him. Again, back into proper relationship. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. And, and he says that when we confess that there are benefits. God wants to hear from us and he knows the benefit that we receive when we're willing to confess. And so that's the last question. Um, what are the benefits? What does confession do for us? And the bottom line, verses 1 and 2 tell us this, that when we confess, we are blessed. We are blessed. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is in, in whose spirit is no deceit. We are blessed because it brings us back. Confession brings us back to proper relationship with our Creator. We are blessed because all of that inner pressure and unrest is removed. And we are blessed because God covers our sin. If you don't mind writing in your Bible and you have the means to do so, circle that word cover. Because we see it again in verse 5. But there's a difference. See, David says, David says, I didn't attempt to cover my sin. When I didn't attempt to cover it. Now what he's what he's really saying there is that one time he did cover it. I mean, he made excuses for it. He covered it up. But he said, when I didn't cover it, and, and now in verse, in, in verse 1, um, it says, uh, yeah, verse 1, the end of verse 1, it says, the man, blessed is the man whose sins are covered. See, that word that you just circled in verse 1 is a very interesting word because it, in our minds it means one thing. To cover something is like covering a dish. You take the lid and you cover that dish with it or to cover someone up with a blanket. But this word literally means to lift up and remove. The word that's used for cover there literally means to lift up and remove. And, and, and so look at it again in, in, this, in this light. David in verse 5 says, I acknowledge my sin and uncovered it. And then verse 1 says that when David did that, God covered his sin. I acknowledge my sin and uncovered it before the Lord, and the Lord covered it. He lifted it up. And he removed it. There's a great difference in our covering the sin in our lives and God covering it for us. When we cover sin, we attempt to hide it. When God covers it, the sin first must be exposed. And then he covers it in such a way that it's taken from us. Now, here's what I learned in studying Psalm 32. When David writes those first five verses... What he has in mind is the account in Genesis chapter 3. We talked a little bit about that last week. Remember when we said that 
God came to the garden during the cool of the day to walk with Adam and to walk with Eve. And when he got there on one particular day, um, they were hiding. And why were they hiding? Why were they hiding? I haven't heard, maybe somebody said it, but I haven't heard it. You can say it. No, it wasn't really because they ate from the tree. They were naked. That's why they hid. They were naked. You can say that word in here. They were, they were naked. Now, they realized they were naked because they had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and this is actually a reference to that. I mean, I want you to think about this. In Genesis, God created Adam and Eve. Every night he met, with, uh, met them to be with them, to walk with them. And one time he shows up and they were naked. They were uncovered. Um, I'm sorry. In the beginning of that, they were naked. They were uncovered, but it was okay. All right? Because um, they were morally uh, good. Sin wasn't in their lives. And so... It, it didn't bother them that, that they were uncovered. Um, one night, God showed up, and they dove into the bushes. They hid. And God says to them, what's wrong? And Adam and Eve said, we're hiding because we are naked. Now, it's a silly statement, but it's a true theological statement that, that they are naked. It's silly because God could have said to them, but Adam, every night you're naked. I mean, you've always been naked. If you're hiding because you're naked, why haven't you hidden before? It can't just be that you're naked. Something else is going on. And so what's going on is this, that when Adam and Eve sinned, they could no longer bear the transparency. See, we don't mind someone looking at our lives and looking into our lives as long as things look good. But when there's something wrong we no longer like it. We don't want someone to examine our lives. When Adam and Eve sinned, they could no longer bear transparency. They could not stand their nakedness because what is nakedness? Nakedness is when you don't control what people see. You have nothing to hide it. You have nothing to cover it up. And so you don't control what they see. Nakedness is when you cannot manage another person's perception. Nakedness is when people see all the way in. Until you sin, there's no problem with nakedness. Why was it that Adam and Eve suddenly couldn't stand being looked at? Why was it they suddenly had to control what God saw and what each other saw? Why was it they suddenly had to hide? Why was it they suddenly had to cover up? Because when they sinned, the theologians say, they lost the covering that they had before. The covering, the clothing of original righteousness, of moral beauty. See, Adam and Eve didn't mind what people saw. They didn't mind what God saw. They didn't mind what each other saw because originally they were clothed. They were covered with moral beauty. They knew they were beautiful. They knew they were perfect. And they didn't mind being seen. But the minute they lost their righteousness, they were stained and they couldn't stand to be seen any longer. And so you know what they did? They tried to cover it up. They took fig leaves and they fashioned clothes to cover up. And you know what God said when he came along? He said, if you will take that stuff off, then I will clothe you. And it's the first instance that we have of a sacrifice in the Bible. Because God took the life of an animal in order to clothe Adam and Eve. And that's what God promises that he'll do. If we'll just simply uncover our sin. Well, this morning I simply want to conclude with, with Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 4 through 8. Um, some of you will know that Ezekiel chapter 16 is actually the story of of Israel 
but this section is it's kind of graphic but at the same time it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful section um, we're going to begin in verse <clears throat> 4 on the day that you were born your cord was not cut nor were you washed with water to make you clean nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths no one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. And then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field, you grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You were you who were naked and bare. Later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine now that's his story and it goes on in this uh, chapter to describe how israel used their beauty how god made them beautiful and, and how israel used the beauty to uh, to basically commit adultery with other nations and other gods but when i look at this description of how god comes and he, he breathes purpose into their lives. It's, it's exactly what he does for us. It's, it's what he was trying to accomplish through Israel by bringing Jesus into the world. And, and Jesus, Jesus is the one who has embraced us. He is the one who has empowered us. He is the one who has cleaned us up. It, it, is, it is he who covers us with his garment. You know, all this description in Psalm 32 of uncovering is, is exactly what, what happens during the process or, or, or this, this, this symbolic process of baptism, that we actually go into it with these old grave clothes on. And, and whenever we are washed, those clothes come off, and we are actually covered with the righteousness of God in His Son, Jesus Christ. It, it's exactly what David describes, if we are willing to uncover our sin. And, and most of us at that initial point are. And I don't know why this happens, but somehow, for some reason, what happens in an individual's life, it happened in my life, it happens in your life, or has happened, or will happen, you will fall into this trap of dusting all around the real issue. And I don't know what your issue is. It could be, it could be an addiction. It could be pride. It could be lust. It could be gossip. It could be, but, but whatever it is, it's something that could be holding you back from that true relationship with God. And so, while I don't know what the response will be, we are going to make the same promise to you today. As we enter this time of invitation and even after the service, even after the service, if you are at a point, if you are at a point where you are ready to get real with God and to let go of whatever this, this sin is, what, whatever this this major issue is that you need to confess. It could be unforgiveness. It could be some sort of bitterness. Then we will make ourselves available to pray with you. There will be men here in just a few minutes. And there will be women who are available, ladies. If we are willing to get real. You know, for some of you, you may be able to confess it right where you are. But, but, but understand this. 
this is, a, a, this is something I think that we have to get over. The church is not somewhere where we come and we look perfect. The church should be somewhere where we come and we can be real with each other. And we can be willing to confess how we failed and when we failed. It should be, and I know that there's, there's a fear there among people. If I do that, then I, I look weak. And it goes back to what I said. It goes back to what I said. None of us want to be examined whenever there's something wrong. But God says it's sometimes necessary. And so I'm going to ask that you all stand right now. And as we go into our time of invitation, decision, feel free to come forward. We will pray with you. Um, let me set your mind at ease. If, if, if you feel uncomfortable confessing something to one of us, we'll just simply pray for you. You can confess it to God. But, but now is the time to set things right in our hearts before him. invitation of Jesus Christ is being offered to you right now. Some may be coming today to make a decision to accept him as their personal savior. I'm not sure. I just know I know that they need God in their life. We are a congregation that loves you. Amen. I desire to ask you to partner with us if that might be a decision today. I don't know what's on your heart at this time. I know that uh, I literally stand in the place where two men of God reigned in their life. Tony Steinmack is one. Jack Edwards is another. But at the funeral yesterday, Miles had a chance to share a few thoughts that Nancy, his daughter, had written. She concluded basically with the answer or the response to her dad, talk to you later. <laughs> How are you going to talk to God later if you're not there? One act you need to have is an act of confession. There's more to it than just that, but that's one of those actions that needs to take place. Some have come today, maybe to make that confession. I'm not sure. God knows. So let's sing now as we offer that invitation of his love to you this day.
like to thank you for being here today to worship with us. As Miles said, we'll still be available if anyone has a desire to come. We'll be willing to talk with you or pray with you, whatever your need may be. Invite you to go ahead and stick around for our uh, Sunday school hour. Also got the coffee and donut time. It's going to be taking place back there in the commons area in just a few minutes. And again, a special welcome to any visitors that we have today. Invite you back again. Bow with me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for decisions that have made, confessions that have been made this day. We just thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you desire to have us be with you in all that we do and all that we say. Dismiss us now at this time. Help us to be drawn back together again to you. Help us to be here and to realize that uh, you put us here to learn more about how to serve you. Let us depart now to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.